Uh, but I do believe I have a word for us tonight. And uh, many of you um, said that you enjoyed um, kind of walking through that fifth chapter of the book of Acts. And um, so I'm going to pick up from there, if you don't mind, tonight. And I'm going to read to you Acts chapter 6. Don't turn there. Verse 1. And this is how chapter 6 starts. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied. My subject tonight is the multiplying church. The multiplying church. Um, as pastor said, I also am so very thankful for what God is doing among us. Our services have been so very powerful and anointed, and the Spirit is at work in our midst, and it is moving greatly, and God is blessing us greatly. New people hungry for God and seeking God have begun to breathe new life and generate excitement for the things of God. And we are in a transitional moment in this church. God is working twofold because many of us are experiencing personal revivals, all while we are harvesting new souls. And it is a simultaneous happening tonight. Our seeds are literally budding and producing while he is still at work within us. And it is beautiful and it is awesome and it is scriptural because the scripture said that the plowman would overtake the reaper, meaning as we harvest, we are also being revived and replenished in the process. And God is doing a quick work today, and he must fix us as he uses us in these last days. And that's why you feel revived, but you also feel stretched at the same time. And that's why you feel rejuvenated and empowered, and yet you feel a little tired and weary all at the same time. And it is because you are being spent as you are being refreshed. I may not be talking to everyone in this place tonight, but some of you are understanding what I'm saying tonight, and you're connecting with me in your spirit because you are getting it and you're seeing it. So Sunday, as I watched and prayed with many around the altar, I couldn't help but think of last Wednesday night's message. Pastor preached so greatly on pulling down strongholds and God was helping many do just that on Sunday. But if you don't mind, allow me tonight to maybe caution us just a little bit further because many of us sitting in this place tonight have a little season on us and we've walked with God for some time and we have conquered many of those strongholds within our own lives. But in our walk with God, we've done something else. We've picked up weights along the way. You've torn down the old fortresses in your life. You've uh, raised some of those strongholds. You are not who you used to be. But as you've navigated your walk with Christ, you've picked up some weights along the way. Hear me tonight. Weights are simply hindrances. They're interferences or impediments that slow our progress. And in the last days, we cannot afford to be a sluggish, impaired, struggling church because God is moving at warp speed. And we must keep up with him and we must move with him as he moves. I know it's Wednesday night, but I've come tonight to challenge the strength of this church because I hear in my spirit the cry of Hebrews 12 where he said, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher 
of our faith. And this is what we've got to get tonight. Many simply won't finish the faith because they will be too slow wrestling with their weights to keep sight of Jesus. And as I get ready to enter into the message tonight, I say to this church in this season, we've got to run with Jesus. We can't be too slow. We can't be too encumbered. We can't be too busy with our own business that we fail to tend to his because this is what a weight truly is. When you chase that word back in the scripture, it comes from a Greek word called onkos. It is the word that we use to get our American word, oncology. Oncology is the study of cancer, the study of tumors. It is the work to get rid of foreign agents that have made their way into the body. Our weights, our hindrances, our excuses, our non-movement, if not dealt with, will destroy the body and it will paralyze the progression of faith. And sadly, it's not from the outside, but it's from within. And God said, lay it aside. Get rid of it. Drop it. In another place, Colossians 3, 9, using the same word, he said it this way, put it off. Put off the old man. It's time to change clothes. It's time to abandon our religious attire and put on our running shoes because we are in a race against the rapture and we can't allow anything tonight to slow us down. Amen? And that's a perfect place to start with tonight's message because the early church also had to deal with weights. Two Wednesday nights ago, I preach to you on the subject of the first obstacle of revival. And I took you through Acts chapter 5 and introduced you to the first but of the church. And in that message, there was caution to us uh, that we must continue to be the force that God has called us to be. And if we are going to be that, we must have integrity. What does that really mean? It simply means this. Our actions must align with our professions. Our daily lives must match our Sunday praise. Our characters must be Christ-like because anything less makes us dead weight to an advancing church. Because God was very clear in the message of chapter 5, he is going to have a church in this earth. It's not just going to be some meeting house or some social club with a sermonizer that's tickling the ears of the crowd and robbing God's real storehouse of precious resources. I'm going to be kind. But God is going to have a church, a church full of power, a church rich in anointing, a church walking in miracles and signs and wonders. God's church will be pure. It will be holy. It will walk in authority, and it will conquer everything that opposes it. Amen. I believe that tonight. That's the church I was raised in. That's the church I was taught to believe in. Amen? So when judgment fell, Ananias and Sapphira, God was making it clear how strongly he felt about having a pure church. Hear me tonight. When we are in a right standing with him, nothing is impossible to us. Say that again. When we are in a right standing with him, nothing is impossible to us. Here's scripture for that. Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first 
the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Righteousness, right standing with God unlocks all things in the kingdom of God. Sin separates from God. Always has, always will. You cannot be in fellowship with him with willful, blatant sin in your life. Now, I know we all fall short of the glory, and in doing so, we commit sin. I get it. I understand that. You understand that. God understands that. But there is a great difference tonight in falling short and intentional sin. Many of the other apostles had fallen short. They had areas in their life that were less than righteous. But when intentional sin stepped in the house, God made a point and judgment came. But when judgment purged the house of intentional sin. Pastor and I talked about that. A lot of times people want to purge it. Amen. I don't want to see anybody leave out of here. Amen. I'd like to see intentional sin leave out of here. Amen. Repentance is a gift. My grandmother taught me this. She said, son, repentance is a gift. You go to the Lord daily. You let him know you know exactly who you are. It's not a curse. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's a gift that you get to share with the Lord every day. Amen. Praise God. I'm talking about intentional sin because what happens when judgment uh, comes and purges the house of intentional sin, what we saw in chapter 5 was miracles begin to flow. This is what I'm saying tonight. God can handle our misstep. He can handle our falling short and he can continue to use us. Aren't you thankful for that? I'm thankful for that grace and mercy. I need it every day. Why is this important? This is important because we are carriers of the message. And God can't endorse our mess because it compromises the message. And here it is. This is the principle. The demonstration of his power is always to set up the preaching of his message. It was Jesus' method. It was the early church's method. It was the Apostle Paul's method. And it will still work today. The demonstration of his power will always set up an opportunity to preach his message. Why? Because the miracle serves the message. The demonstration serves the message. It's all about the message. Everybody's talking about this revival in Asbury. Everybody's uh, intrigued. Many are wondering. Believe it or not, many are criticizing. Many are speaking faith toward it. And wherever you land tonight on the spectrum, rest assured of this. That demonstration has a purpose, and the purpose is the message of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because God has proven time and time in his word that that is his method. The demonstration always sets up the message. The miracles drew Nicodemus to Jesus By night, but the message had him stand before the Sanhedrin and beg the body of Jesus from the cross in the light of day. The demonstration told him this is a man sent from God, but the message, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again, told him. This is more than just a man. And it changed the course of Nicodemus' life. Because it's our message that makes the difference. Conversely, when men... 
become driven by evil motives and they lose their integrity, the demonstration leaves and the message is not enough for them any longer. And that's why they leave the message because they have no fellowship with God. God doesn't work for them like he did before and they conclude somehow in that state of confusion that the message is wrong or the message is in error, but oh, how wrong they are because the message is his word, and his word, last I checked, is forever settled. Why? Because it works. Our message works. We don't need a new message because God isn't changing his mind. He didn't change his mind way back then. He didn't change his mind 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago. And in 2023, with all the chaos going on around us, God still hasn't changed his mind. His word is still forever settled, and the message doesn't need changing tonight. The message doesn't change. So what changes? It's us. So God in his wisdom taught us this lesson. It was a costly lesson because someone paid with their life, but it was for the betterment of the church because no one is bigger than the church. You may not be here, and I may not be here, but the church will always be here. Amen. So when we pass the integrity test, here's what we get. Prisons can't stop us. Persecutions can't stop us. Powers of evil can't stop us. And we will operate with a spirit of thankfulness and gratitude. And God works for him and for us, and we work for him. And the church grows as a result. How do we know? Because the first line of chapter 6 declares this. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied. Chapter 5 started with a but that threatened integrity and unity. However, after providing or proving himself faithful, God showed up. Miracles, signs, and wonders started flowing again among them, and God gave them great favor by showing himself strong on their behalf. But here is the lesson. It ends with these words. Chapter 5 literally closes with these words. They ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. The demonstration gave stage to the message. And in those days, the days of preaching and teaching, the days of proclamation of the message, the number of the disciples multiplied. Anybody thankful for that? Amen. Thank God it didn't fizzle out. Thank God somebody couldn't stamp it out. Thank God somebody couldn't doubt it out. Come on. Who knows what the future holds from what's going on at that college? Who knows whose soul is in the balance? Amen? Praise God. We don't even know who to give credit to for why we're here today because somebody kept the faith and the message kept being preached. So the number of the disciples multiplied. Because a message was still proclaimed. This church, the church is awesome. The church is awesome. I love the church. I love this particular assembly. But God's church far and wide as a whole is awesome. I'm so thankful tonight to be a part of the church. I can tell you tonight that I know that I did not get here by myself. I can tell you tonight that I know that I'm not some great hero or great thing because I belong to the church. I know 
tonight I don't have some kind of special status because I belong to the church. I understand tonight that I am simply blessed of God that he saw fit to save me. I don't stand here tonight believing that I'm better than anyone else. I don't stand here tonight believing that I have value above any other. I know that I am flesh just like the rest of us tonight. I don't really have a pedigree that should have landed me here. My lineage is nothing special. I was born to two regular people. You know one of them. And I'm fully aware. She's pretty special. I'm fully aware that I'm nothing, nothing without him. I'm not on some random rant tonight, but... I'm setting up a point here because if we are not careful, we can forget where we came from. We can forget that we all are just a bunch of sinners saved by his amazing grace. Come on, somebody. We can forget what it felt like to be hopeless and desperate and lost and without him if we aren't careful. And we can rejoice in what God has done. And we can develop a sense of entitlement. And we can develop a governing spirit or a spirit of ownership. Stay with me, please. We've given our money We've given our time. We've lived our life for this. And sometimes we forget. This is not ours. The building may be ours. The property may be ours. But the church is his. We don't own a patent tonight on salvation. We don't decide who's worthy. We don't decide who is not. We don't get to determine those things. But our role is very clear. We must simply continue with the message, with the mission. And that is to preach the gospel to every creature till he returns. No one is excluded. No one is to be left out. No one is to be neglected. But it is our responsibility to God to take what he has put in us and make sure that someone is introduced to that same grace and Those that passed the testing and judgment of chapter 5 are now ready more than ever to continue to be the church that God has called them to be. They have realized that the preaching of the gospel is far deeper than just taking a text and blasting everything or sermonizing or entertaining. But they understood a true spirit of Christ must minister to needs. And guess what? There are needs that are spiritual and there are needs that are natural. But a true church, a complete church, a multiplying church can't minister to one and neglect the other but we must be willing to address both. As the church grows, we're going to see all kinds of people. As the church grows, we're going to encounter all kinds of need. As the church grows, you may see things that you don't particularly care for, but you must remember. They are not joining you. They are marrying 
him. And you don't get to tell the groom who to take as his bride. You just show up to the wedding (laughs) and just make sure that you don't get a bad attitude about it. (laughs) Hey, I was going in a whole different direction tonight. But today, as I began to look at this, God laid this on my heart. And he said, tell my church, while the church is growing, while the church was on the move, while the church was seeing great revival and harvest, there were underlying problems. The great church of the book of Acts. It cracks me up. Nobody wants to be Pentecostal anymore. Everybody wants to be apostolic. Right? I'm apostolic from the top of my head to the sole of my foot. I believe in living the apostles' doctrine. But this apostolic church, this beginning church, had some underlying problems. Because what I didn't read to you, the end of verse 1 of chapter 6 was, there was murmuring. In those same days, as the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose murmuring and complaining and griping, and criticism. Mind you now, these are not bad people. These are the ones we want to be like. These are not evil people. They've all passed the integrity test. They're all in chapter 6. They all made it. They didn't die in judgment. They're good people, but they have a little problem. This is it. They've been here long enough. Can I just say what the Lord said today? They've been here long enough that they think their opinion outweighs the purpose of God. Oh, help us, Jesus. Friends, we can't get so religious that we know better than God. I hope I'm not out of order for teaching this. Please judge my spirit. I'm not trying to be disrespectful or mean, but I'm speaking tonight in all humility and love and from a position of experience and the Word of God. When our opinions get in the way of God's, when they begin to outweigh God's, when we suddenly know more than Him, when our traditions overshadow His transcendence, we get out of life. And we get out of balance. And we ourselves need to repent. Hear me tonight. When you oppose the will of God or his purpose, you operate, whether you believe it or like it or not, in an anti-Christ spirit. You must be careful what you judge. You must be careful what you say. You must be careful that your attitude doesn't get cross-threaded with his will. I'm not teaching this tonight because this is right where we are. Follow me into the early church of chapter 6. New people are showing up daily. New people are bringing new things. New thoughts, new challenges, new giftings, new personalities. All types of things are coming as God is adding to the church. And something happened. Apparently, the established folks didn't like too much what they were seeing. Because the new folks started telling them. Notice that the complaint came from the Greek speakers against the Hebrew speakers. That's what verse 1 continued to tell you. The Greek-speaking crowd said that the Hebrew-speaking crowd is treating us unfairly. They are favoring themselves above us. I could go into a whole lesson about these two distinctions, but let me make it very clear tonight who they are 
or better yet, who they represent. If you know anything about the Bible, you know that the Testaments are diverse in languages. The Old Testament in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. The Hebrew speakers were the ones that had been there the longest. (laughs) They had tradition on their side. They had lineage working in their favor. They were the foundation. We paid for this. They had their pews marked. Their Bibles were securely (laughs) protecting their seat right beside their blanket. Don't mess with it. (laughs) They had a parking spot. They had status. They were us. Come on now. They were us. And here comes all these new folk. They speak a different language. They're from a different background. They've got a different culture. They don't look like us. They don't act like us. They're outsiders. And they started making distinctions. They started the first click. Amen. They started the first water fountain gossip group. But here's what they really did. They started the first measuring within the church. Bless God, we've been here since Abraham. Our roots are deep. My heritage is great. And they started seeing themselves as being above these newcomers. I'm preaching to us tonight. I hope you understand. God's saying something to us tonight. Who are they coming in here? Look at them taking over our church. Who do they think paid for this? Don't they know what it takes? Don't they know what we've done to have what we have? Just roll in here, expect us to take care of them. Come on now. And in the midst of all God was doing that was right, the people that should have been rejoicing the most had attitudes that were wrong. Let me remind you again, we didn't do anything to merit what we have received. We are not here because of ourselves. His grace and mercy drug me in this house today. They're the only things that have gotten us here. Yes, you were obedient. I give you that. But it was his grace and mercy that came looking for you. Yes, you repented and you received his spirit, but it was his mercy that drew you unto him. Can I just say it like this tonight, very plain and simply? We cannot sit in the seat of judgment against those that God is adding. No matter where they come from, no matter what they've done, no matter where they've been, they're not lesser than us. They're not below us. They are all God's children just the same. And we got to treat them as such. These entitled ones were becoming the problem. They were bombarding the apostles with their complaints. They were overwhelming them with a problem that should not have been a problem at all. But there's something that is happening here. And while there's not much detail from the Scripture, there's some things we can ascertain from the apostles' reaction. This contention was wearying them. It was wearing them out. And there's a great lesson here about leadership within the church, but I'm going to leave that alone because this is what we need to understand. We don't need weary frustrated leadership over trivial things in this last day. Because when the ministry is wearied, they become ineffective. And if you can't be saved without a preacher, you better pray that your preacher is preaching. What are you talking about, Brother Hodge? I can read it right here. The apostles quit preaching and started problem solving. It doesn't say exactly like that in black and white. (laughs) But in my spirit, I can feel their frustration because in verse 2, we find they 
finally had enough, and they called an assembly together, and this was their statement. We can't leave the Word of God to serve Tate. In other words, we have dealt with this issue long enough. This is a problem you have, and you need to work it out. We've been sidetracked, and we have got to get back to preaching. And this is the lesson if we will learn from it, and we won't have to repeat it. This is it. The enemy was trying to stop the word. He was trying to stop the message. And he got in the ear of some good, godly people. Crossed up their thinking. He played on their human nature. And through deception, he worked the oldest of all his tricks. Because he wanted one thing. Stop the message. When the apostles determined to preach anyway, we find a wonderful outcome, verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. And this is what I came to say tonight. As we grow, and God sends new people, guard your Spirit, because you might be surprised at the thoughts the enemy will fling at you. And if we aren't intentional, and if we aren't aware, we could forfeit what God has planned for us. Come on, somebody. I don't know how you feel. But I want to be a part of a church where the word of God increases and the number of disciples multiplies and we all become obedient to the faith. But to have that, I've got to keep my attitude right. I've got to keep my spirit right. I can't stand in opposition and sit around here thinking that I'm better than anyone else. But I've got to remember this message is for whosoever will. And that's what I'm praying for tonight. I'm praying God among us keep sending, keep directing folks this way, keep building this local assembly. But in doing so, remind us Hebrew speakers that you're still Lord of all and you're Lord to all. You know, we get this, we know. We can expect outside resistance. We know the devil hates us. <laughs> you, 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 didn't, you, didn't have to, you didn't have to be in here very long to find out. You start trying to do something right, man, the floodgates open with opportunities to do wrong. Even the great, even the great apostle said, when I try to do something good, this devil is everywhere. We know this. We can't do much about the outside resistance. They're going to be against us. Oh, but Lord, help us when we have to war against inside resistance. Let me say it like this tonight. We've got enough to worry about out there. Let's create a safe environment in here. Come on now. We need a safe place. We need a place of refuge. We need a place of strength and a place of hope. We need the preacher preaching. We need the choir singing. We need the worshipers outweighing the whiners. And this is what I've found, Pastor, in my ministry and in my years. This is what produces that involvement. Involvement brings unity. Activity brings unity. A sense of purpose brings unity. Putting people to work with a clear vision and mission brings unity. Why is unity so important? Because the alternative to it is division. And division has one goal. 
kill the vision. Why are these two groups arguing? Division. Division showed up. And the vision was suffering. Tonight, armed with this understanding and this example, we ought to arise in our spirits. We ought to rebuke division and release the vision. Amen. What causes the people to perish? No vision. Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. You know what will send us forward? Clear vision. Habakkuk 2 and 2. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. So this is what I say tonight. Preach to me, Pastor. Keep casting vision and let's see what God will do. Amen. Praise God. Anybody with me tonight? That's what I want to see in this place. Let's keep preaching. Let's keep doing. Let's stay faithful. Let's not get an attitude, and let's see as all of this that God is doing around us is only the beginning of what he's got planned for us. I don't know about you tonight, but I believe that with every fiber of my being. God has got something great in store for us, and I'm not getting in the way. I'm going to preach with the preacher. I'm going to worship with the singers. I'm going to pray with those that come in. I'm going to lay hands I'm going to speak faith, and I'm going to watch God add to the church daily such as should be saved. If you believe that tonight, stand with me. Pastor's coming to dismiss us tonight. I hope that I've helped you tonight. I hope this word will find a resting place in our spirit tonight. Amen.